Hey everybody, Jared of Second Light Design. Welcome back to Milling Monday. Uh, I have a little bit of a different video today. I'm going to share a couple websites that I use in kind of gaining knowledge on lumber. Uh, there's a couple different ones that I use and they're very fast. And this is, you know, this would be the scenario where you get a phone call from an arborist at 10 a.m. and says, you know, hey, I've got this tree coming down and I can drop it off at 4 p.m. Do you want it? And you don't know anything about the wood, you don't know what to look for, how heavy it is, you know, how much it's going to shrink, how hard it is, and you need to find out quickly so you can make an informed decision on what's going on. So I'm going to basically be sharing some screens for, uh, for my computer and show you what I look for and how I use these two sides. So I will copy them down below in the description so you can find them on your own. But yeah, just some good information coming in, so stick with it. All right, so I made my cursor a little bit bigger so you can see everything pretty well. Uh, you know, like I was saying, our scenario is the arborist calls you and it is, you got to make a five minute decision whether you want a, a log or not. Uh, for today's purposes, I chose Red Elm. That's just kind of an odd one that I had never heard of before. And it, it ended up being a really nice log, but it is a, it's also a really nice wood. I would always go after an elm tree, but go into your search engine, search, red elm wood you're going to get the wood database that is what we're looking for we'll click on that this is the screen that i look for just a really quick reference whenever i am kind of doing research into trees so common name red elm also known as slippery elm or soft elm you know there's the scientific name kind of its region how big it gets the average dried weight and all that uh, the, one of the biggest things I look for is this what's called this Janka hardness and we're going to click on that and what is the Janka hardness? So if this is the wood, this would be a steel ball, like a, a steel ball bearing. It's a half inch in diameter or 0.444 thousandths and the Janka hardness is how much pressure it takes to drive that ball ha half its distance into the wood. Now, who came up with that test and why? I have no idea. I just know that they did, and it gives us a number for to gauge how hard something is. So that's the 860 pound feet of pressure. You know, if this is in a hydraulic press or something, it'd take 860 pounds of force to drive that ball in a half its distance. Again, that's kind of a convoluted test, but that's what they came up with, and that's how we determine how hard things are. I'll show you a couple other quick examples in a minute of different woods and their hardness and how that in kind of a relation to that. The other things to, to look for is the shrinkage, you know, in the radial and tangential shrinkage. That is kind of the, in the different planes that the wood is going to shrink. Uh, if you click on this, it does break this down further and give you some really nice um, kind of the science behind things. And I would really, you know, you can go on a deep dive on this stuff and you know improve your knowledge a lot on on lumber and wood drying and things like that the you know, drying wood is a science that i don't know if everyone has its own you know has a handle on but it, there is a lot to it and i think it's an ever-evolving thing so wood shrinkage is definitely something to be mindful of um, and in my experience with air drying things it's definitely a little bit slower of a process obviously so you know, I found that something like a walnut is a lot better drying than something like red oak. You know, and I can kind of take those, take my experience and cross-reference it with these percentages and kind of use that for information going forward. Scrolling down a little bit, there's other things that are relevant to this species. You know, it goes into the color and appearance, the grain texture. So, like this says, the grain is interlocked, so that's going to be, for people that are using this for firewood, it's going to be really tough to split this because it's very stringy and splintery and doesn't want to come apart really cleanly, like something like an ash wood or something like that. You know, it talks about the end grain, and that can be nice if you start getting a handle on the end grains of how they look for identification. You know, a lot of times when we're getting uh, the log, it doesn't have the leaves with it. That's the easiest way to identify a tree is with the leaves. When we get things, we're getting the log. Sometimes it has the bark, sometimes it doesn't. We have to kind of go, we have to use different things to identify. So being able to look at the end grain can help with that as well. The rot resistance, this is really helpful if you are determining if something would be useful for outdoor furniture. 
Uh, in the U.S., there's not many woods that are there, there's more woods that are not usable for outdoor stuff than there are that that would be usable for outdoor stuff. Uh, you know, the cedars and the, the redwoods and things like that obviously are. You can get into white oaks, and they're definitely usable. And this is a good indication of that that it is not. It is susceptible to insect attack. Um, the elm trees of any sort, they were all they a lot of them were hit with the Dutch elm disease, kind of similar to what the emerald ash borer was uh, that's currently going on. The Dutch elm disease was earlier than that, so it's a similar thing to the emerald ash borer. You know, and this gives it, this goes into further detail about the workability, you know, of you know how it can work with tools and you know if there's tear out and things like that, the smell that comes with it, allergies, if this is a if this tree is a sensitizer. You know, people have different allergies to different things, and they're sensitive to, to different things. I know myself, uh, walnut sawdust, if it gets on my arms and I'm sweating at all, it will cause me to break out really bad. I, it is a sensitizer to me. I will still obviously plane it, but it is something that I have to be aware of um, when I'm working with walnut. Uh, pricing is always really helpful, and this kind of this is a very this is a variable category. It depends a lot on your region, so. Use it as a guideline. I wouldn't get too wrapped up in it. And it goes into some other things um, that are just useful to, for different things, uh, you know, different information about things. What was Elm used for? It's for baskets and furniture and hockey sticks. You know, it can be all, uh, there's a lot of different information with each one of these. Uh, this one, you know, talks about the Dutch Elm disease. So obviously there's a lot to go into this. Uh, this related articles uh, part, this is really helpful for. I'm going to click over to another another species. We're going to look at red oak real quick. So I'll get back to the related articles in a second. This one, the Janka hardness, is much higher, and that's so. This gives us a relation. You, if you know how hard red oak is, red elm is is softer than that. How much softer? Well, we need you know, like the low end. You need to find something that's way softer so we can have a, a baseline to establish it with. But this is the same characteristics. It has it all in here, you know, and this has a lot of different woods that are in this database. So there's a lot of different things to look at. Uh, going back to these related articles, uh, distinguishing red oak and white oak. That is a big topic, and there's this is an awesome article on this, and being able to determine between them and what falls into different categories. Uh, any oak trees in the U.S., for the most part, they fall in, they're either red oak or white oak. Whether it's a pin oak, a bur oak, a swamp oak, whatever, they're going to be red oak or white oak. That's really what it comes down to. And so being able to break that down a little bit more is very helpful. So, yeah, really good stuff in here. I want to show one, a couple more I want to uh, touch on. Uh, this, so this is hard maple. This is a very dense, very hard wood. As you can tell, it is, uh, has a very high hardness scale. So that is just under twice as hard as red elm. So, you know, that can give you a good indication of how hard hard maple really is. Uh, there's some, like, a, a little, small little links here you can click on, you know, and what a bird's eye maple figuring is. So it's a, an anomaly, basically, that's covered in there. And this breaks, you know, has another link that breaks that down further. Uh, clicking over, I want to talk about uh get the low limit you know we can talk about how hard things are eastern white pine uh, almost as soft as there is and in, in the wood form it's down to 380 pound uh, pounds of force so this is you know 500 pounds less than the red elm and you know four five times less than what hard maple is so you know this can, you can kind of use this as a scale to kind of you work with your native species and see where they fall and help you get a kind of a baseline on where things are at. The second website I use a lot, this is part of WoodWeb, and WoodWeb has a lot of different calculators on here. Uh, I use this one that is just for calculating log weight, and this is, is helpful if you're doing any remote milling, and you are, let, let, let's uh, just get into this. So, let's say you are, Let's go with our slippery elm. That's the same as our red elm. And someone wants this remote milled. And let's see, a small diameter is 40 inch. Big diameter is 40 inch. And this one is 8 feet long. How much does this weigh? Okay, so this is going to be a pretty heavy log. So it's estimated weight. 
is 3,600 pounds, almost 3,700 pounds. So that's a pretty big log, but that's also, it's pretty heavy. and That's on par for a hardwood. That's not too far out of line. So where this is critical, if you're bidding a job for, you know, you're remote milling this and you got to drag it out of somewhere, if you mill it into 10 pieces, that's fine, but you're still going to have 10 pieces divided by that. So, you know, each one's going to weigh 360 pounds. So that's something to think about as well. Uh, one last point about this, um, it's kind of, they don't really touch on this a lot. It's not really known. They don't make a big point of this, but it's assumed that the moisture content of the logs is 75%. So that is incredibly green. That is a very, very green log that is incredibly saturated with water. So if anything, this is a heavy number. It could only be lighter. All right, so I didn't want to get that too long. You know, there's a lot of information to unpack there. There's a lot of rabbit holes you can go down. I would highly recommend, you know, you got your break time, you got, you know, before you go to sleep, something, take 20 minutes, you know, and go down some of the rabbit holes on, you know, looking at, you know, white oak versus red oak, the different kinds of uh, softwoods out there, the different woods in your region. You know, there's a lot of stuff to, out there, you know, increase your knowledge about it. That's going to make, make better decisions for you. You know, if you are, have better knowledge of the trees. You know, when you instead of just saying yes to everything, you can you can be a little more selective and you know, make a better use of your time when you're milling. So that's kind of the thought behind that. Um, the one thing this doesn't account for is tree identification, and I touched on it a little bit. More times than not, whenever we were getting the logs, there's no bark on, there's no leaves, there's no bark on it. Sometimes you have all you have is the wood. You know, without a doubt, the easiest way to identify a tree is with the leaves. So. You know, and I've tried different apps, you know, that use the bark and they're so-so. Some of them, work, they work on some trees, they don't work on others. But tree identification is a whole science in its own, in its own regard that is something that it's not a, an easy learn. You know, I can't really explain that in an, in an easy way to you. I would highly recommend going out to your local parks, nature centers, preserves, uh, look at whatever signage they have, you know, do some research on a local level of what is in your local area. And there, any, any museum, nature center, whatever, they're going to have the different signage that shows the different bark, the different leaves, all that stuff that's going to help you kind of start to identify trees. Um, you know, generally, for the most part, when you work with an arborist, they're going to know, you know, that's what they do, they're tree guys, but it, it's not always the case. So, you know, for your own, your, your own, um, your own benefit. Working on tree identification is important as well, but it takes a little bit longer. So something to think about there. Uh, that's all I got for this week, guys. I appreciate everybody sticking with me and you know, all the support, all the thumbs up, all the likes, new subscriptions, really appreciate it. You know, it means a lot. I'm, I'm in the middle of the, the dead of winter here in Illinois, and it is a frozen wasteland that is nowhere, no fun to be had outside. So I'm stuck in the shop. I can't do the milling that I like doing but we're making the best of it. So if you have any other questions or comments, drop them down below. You can always find me on Instagram at Second Life Design. And thank you.